use this handout solution for the single edge crack to get K given the stress of 200 MPAs and the width, the total width is 100 millimeters and three different crack lengths. So to do that, you need to use this um, this slide. So you, you need to use that one and that's a single edge notch. Now three crack lengths, so let's look at the problem again and then try to work through that. Crack length 2.5, 12.5, 37.5 millimeters and the stress already is MPA. I told you yesterday when you do the K calculation you have to be careful of units. So normally I do all the calculations with mega newtons or MPA mega pascal in um, meters because the, the standard uh, unit is MPA square root of meter. So if you do that, you don't make a mistake. The problem you could see is when you have a conversion of a thousand and you take a square root, you don't have a decade anymore. The metric or the SI is based on decades, but if you take square roots, you lose that decade. So you can't do that all the time. So that, that's the big problem there. Here's my solution. I set up a table and I'll go through one example. Uh, for the first crack size of 2.5 mil, uh, millimeters, A over B is 0.025. Now you have to use the graph on this one because there is no table, just a graph. And when you use the graph, if you get a different number from other people, you shouldn't you shouldn't be uh, concerned. 0.025 is way back here. Let's see if I can get way back here. So the graphical value is 1.1. That's the graphical value, 1.1. And um, then that's normalized, 1.1, 1, 1 minus A over B to the 3 halves power. If you can't read the slide, you should look at your handout. So you have to unnormalize that, and to unnormalize that, go back here. So take a over B, get a graphical value of 1.1, then unnormalize it like this, 1.1 minus 1 minus, this is 0.025, and that's to the 3 halves power. And then the, the F, capital F, is 1.14. So K here, 200, square root of, um, 0.025, that's 2.5 millimeters, and pi, they're both under the radical, and then 1.14 is 20.2. So I don't know questions on that. We'll be using that graph sum and the table sum, so you'll have to try to get used to them. Now, the other values, A of 12.5 and 37.5, you do a similar thing, take a over W, or A over B here. Uh, remember B is that Tata, use the wrong symbol. And then get a graphical value. Look at this one, 37.5, If you use 0.375, the graphical value is 1.1. Right about there. Now, uh, you might read the graph differently from what I do. So when you're working with graphical values, you have to be aware that you might be off by a few percent. Uh, if you are an experimentalist like I am, a few percent doesn't make any difference. If you're a mechanics like a numerical person, 
they do everything accurate to 0.1% or so. So they do 0.1%, but we can't do a test that is with accurate 0.1%. So say, who cares? Anyway, back to the table. And then I have to unnormalize that. It would be 0.98. Take 1 minus 0.375 bracket to the 3 halves power. There's that value. Divide that into 0 0.98, get 1.98, uh, and then put it all together with K. Stress is the same. Crack size is different. Capital F is different. So when you put them all together, I got about 135.9. Now, um, let's see. Okay, that's, that's that one. Questions on that one? I wanted to tell you one more thing, but I forgot it. It's uh, old age. Okay, so you, you should get used to doing those computations. Now, look at this next one. We were talking about plastic zone sizes. And so this problem says, what is the plain stress plastic zone size for the two K values in problem 1A for two yield strengths, 240 MPAs and 1,200 MPAs? And then if you have that geometry, what percent of the ligament, which is the W minus A, is covered by the plastic zone? So uh, to tell whether you're good for using the K approach, which is essentially linear elastic, or you're not good for using the K approach, you wanna see how big is the plastic zone and compare it with something in your structure. In this case, the structure, of course, is a specimen. So, um, let me show you what the two K values were. The 2K values for problem 1A were 43.2 and 61.0. So I'm going to work with those 2K values and also the two uh, yield strength values. When you're doing, uh, when you're doing the um, plastic zone size, by default, use plain stress. So the coefficient out front for plain stress, 1 over 2 pi. Then inside is k over the yield strength quantity squared. So I'm starting with the first k value, 43.2, yield strength 240. Do the arithmetic, get 0 0.0052 meters or 5.2 millimeters. Uh, w minus a is 25. So the plastic zone divided by the ligament is about 0.208 or 21% about. 21% is already pretty big. Now if you take the higher yield strength and do the same thing, the plastic zone size is 0.21 millimeters and that covers about 0.8% want to point out here that if you have a very high strength material, relatively high strength, then the linear fracture mechanics using K approach works very well. If you have a lower strength material, it doesn't work so well. Uh, the other thing K approach has problems with is uh, non-isotropic materials. And people were talking a lot about composite materials. If you're doing composite materials, the K approach has some problems. I'm going to say a little bit more about composite materials later in the week or next week. I haven't decided yet because I didn't know you were so interested, but I, I look up some things on that and uh, found still work ongoing on, on composite materials around the world, so there's still interest. So you can just look at this um, after the crack growth, the K was 61. 
and here is then a plastic zone size of 10 millimeters. Now notice the ligament size W minus A because the crack grew 5 millimeters went from 25 down to 20. So the W minus A is only 20 and that covers 50 percent of, of the ligament. Again that's, that's uh, no good. That, that won't work. Okay, that's a little bit of problem solving and we want to do that from time to time. I think the only way you can really learn things is by doing some problems instead of just sitting and listening to me talk all the time. Now, here is a um, fairly long session so we might not get through it before the break but we'll we'll get started and then when the break time comes we'll have the break anyway this is fracture toughness testing one of the ways to understand fracture mechanics is to look at the testing and the requirements and I'll do that in several of the behaviors fracture toughness fatigue and environmental enhancement. I will not look at it in detail for the most part except in this section. I uh, want to look at it in detail to show you how the the standards are set up. Uh, we use ASTM which is American Society for Testing and Materials in the US. Do you have your own standard society in India? Or you use SI or ISO? No, we, we follow ASTM. ASTM. Yeah, uh, a lot of people do, and the people who, who have their own societies usually use ASTM as kind of a model to write their own standards. So I know many countries do, um, Japan, Australia, Europe, all of Europe, the European Union has their own things and writes their own standards, but they follow ASTM, especially fracture toughness testing it's important to understand how the thing is set up and also how what's important and what's not important a little bit of that so fracture toughness here resistance to crack extension under monotonic loading and for linear elastic fracture mechanics that is when the K works the fracture toughness is called K1C uh, normally the people who work in the standards and are part of the fracture mechanics community say K1C. People who are outside the community use all different word, words, K sub IC, KIC, whatever. If you want to go to a meeting of fracture people and pretend you're an expert, you should say K1C. Then the people say, oh, that's an expert because he say K1C instead of some other name. So it's important to learn the names that most people use. The, K1C is being redone somewhat, but is usually done now by, or was done historically by the standard E399. So um, ASTM has E standards uh, that are for mechanical testing, and they're all in one book, .0301, and I was going to bring that along, but it weighed so much as I told you yesterday that I would have had to leave my clothes at home to bring that along so I brought clothing instead uh, you're probably happy to see me dressed usually we measure K1C versus temperature and um, get an idea how that looks so when I show you data I'll show you K1C versus temperature for the most part just to show you a schematic for steel it looks like this there is a transition for um, low temperature, toughness is low, and normally you can use linear elastic fracture mechanics for this low toughness. And also, yield strength at lower temperature tends to be high. And then as you go to higher temperature, toughness increases dramatically for steels, and um, it's up here, but in between there's a transition. Now, uh, people have not been doing too much research on steels, but people still build a lot of things with steel, so it's still an important material. 
here's a little bit of a summary. ASTM standards have an outline that the standards writers follow. That outline is given by ASTM and says you should have section one, section two, section three. If you're going to try to use that and you never used an ASTM standard before, it's very difficult because the step one isn't first and the step two second. The step one might be on page 10 and the step two on page five and step three on page 11. It's all scattered all over the place. So in order to understand the standard and how to get through it, you need a kind of guide outline to tell you how to go through that. So I'm going to give you a guide. Um, all the standards have identical features which are pretty much like this. You need to get a specimen, prepare the specimen, and almost all the the fracture mechanics specimens need a pre-crack. A pre-crack is a crack that is induced by fatigue loading and it's thought then to be mathematically sharp so it fits the the K um, calculation idea or or the crack tip stress field idea if it's theoretically sharp. So it's introduced by f cracking. You need some kind of fixtures and instrumentation so that people know what you are um, so so that you you uh, measure something I guess. You need a test procedure that you have to follow. When you finish the test you have to do some evaluation. Almost all the standards have something called validity checks which means you check to see whether this, the whole test worked out according to the ASTM standard and then you're supposed to do reporting. A little bit of background on ASTM. It was founded in 1898, so more than 100 years old now, almost 120. <coughs> in 2007, I went to our library at University of Tennessee and counted the volumes and try to estimate how many standards are where. And it was such a job, I never did it again. So that's why I have 2007 rather than 2016. So, but to, in 2007, there were 80 volumes of standards and um, more than 12,000 standards. ASTM writes standards for many, many things. Mechanical testing like tensile, Sharpie, uh, NDT testing, and other things not related to what we do, standards for sports equipment, standards for children's toys, standards for, um, well, all the materials have standards, all the different steels, aluminums, um, copper, titanium, they all have their own standards. <coughs> Standard writing is done in a group now the committee that writes a standard has many people. In uh, fracture mechanics, we have a committee E08. They they use the letter E again for a mechanical sort of thing. E08 has more than 500 people in it, and so 500 people can't sit down and write a standard. So it takes a smaller group, and usually it's a task group or a working group anywhere from one to maybe 10 or 12 people are working on this standard. And the balloting in ASTM is by subcommittee, main committee, and society review, but it's called consensus balloting, which is a special kind of balloting. The uh, balloting is done by everybody agreeing with that standard. If one person disagrees with that standard, it stopped. You can't pass a standard with any one person voting against it. Now, um, if somebody votes against it, you, you have to do something to resolve what we call the negative vote. So the negative vote can be resolved in many ways. You can get the person who wrote negative to try to change the, their mind about it and say maybe they, they made a mistake and they should change their mind. Uh, secondly, if they have a good point, you might rewrite the standard. That particular point that they were against, you would rewrite it. That means you've got to go through all the balloting again. And uh, another way is to get them in a gang and kind of beat them up and 
but it, it's done by uh, voting against their their thing, saying that their uh, vote is not persuasive. So it takes a long time, not only to write the standard, but to get through the balloting, and we say usually about 10 years. So somebody says, we ought to have a standard to test for whatever, and 10 years later you might get it written. This is the ASTM website, which I think uh, you can get some information on it, but they often make you pay for stuff. The goal in fracture testing then is to test the laboratory specimen so that you can relate its behavior, the laboratory behavior that is, to some structural component. The result of a fracture test is called fracture toughness, and you do that test by K if it's a linear elastic material. Uh, linear elastic is usually higher strength, lower toughness. Here are some of the steps then. You would choose a specimen, introduce a crack by fatigue pre-cracking, uh, go to a test machine and get instrumentation, test it to failure or some point, and relate then that to a critical K and maybe repeat that for different uh, range of temperatures. So I want to go through each one of these I told you in this particular lecture, I'm going to do uh, details of the standards so you see details. In the other standards, I won't do so much detail. Here's what it looks like. First page of that, I think it's maybe about 30 pages or so. E390.90. Now, a couple things about that. The dash number is the last year it was written. and uh, it's been rewritten since that uh, time, but the first time, if you can read this, and I think eventually you're going to get copies of my slides, so you, you'll be able to have them and see them better. It was first written in 1970. So 1970 isn't real long ago, but this is really the first fracture mechanic standard, as far as I know, of, of anything. Anyway, um, standards are not okay forever. They have to be revisited and revised every five or so years. And if you don't do that, then eventually it goes out of the books because there, there would be maybe 100,000 standards if all the ones that have been written in the past were, were kept. But they're, they go out of the book when nobody's interested in them anymore. So this was redone in uh, 09 and it's time to get revisited. Uh, if you don't do it in five years, ASTM lets you go a year or so, and then they said this standard is getting out of date. You either have to do something, you revise it and reballot it, or you just reballot it as it is, or you take it out of the books. So here's a, a little bit the K1C test. It's called plain strain linear elastic fracture toughness. You get a specimen with a notch and then introduce a fr uh, fatigue crack and that process is called fatigue pre-cracking. So the, the people in the committee just say we're pre-cracking and pre-cracking of course fatigue is cyclic loading. It's fairly labor intensive. Uh, if you do it in the laboratory it can take hours to pre-crack and usually it takes uh, tens of thousands of cycles to pre-crack. You have to pre-crack to a uh, certain limit. So here are some of the specimens that are used. The most common specimen is called compact and the second most common is single edge bent. And then some special specimen types are here. have pictures of that. This is compact specimen and uh, that's very commonly used and here's single edge bend. The single edge bend I told you yesterday has three point loading, never four point, only three point loading and the span this distance to the width is four to one. Uh, some of the other specimens that could be used and people use them sometimes for special applications. One is called disc compact is this one and it's used if you have round product form and don't want to make a rectangular shape 
like this and just want to use the round product form. Uh, I guess in India you don't play much ice hockey, but people who play ice hockey say, oh, it looks like a hockey puck. You, you have a ice hockey team? Field hockey, I guess. Field but hockey, but um, anyway, so that, that's for round product form. Then um, the arc-shaped specimen, the Army was interested in fracture toughness for big guns, like cannon guns. Uh, because when a cannon wall blows up, which could happen, it, it's a fracture mechanics event, it's not good for the people who are using that gun. And so they tested fracture toughness on cannon walls and they didn't want to make a rectangular form and so they just cut a hunk of cannon wall out and put a crack in it. Uh, every time you get a new specimen, you have to do all the calibrations. So anybody who wants a new specimen can propose it, but you have to do the calibrations yourself. Nowadays, I think calibrations would be done numerically. You do it with finite element. Uh, the middle crack specimen is the old Griffiths geometry. is not used for fracture testing, fracture toughness testing. ASTM has a nomenclature and they have a first letter and then one in parentheses or two letters for example here single edge and then parentheses B this means it's tested in bending uh, this shape compact DC parentheses T means it's tested in tension the uh, two most common specimens compact and single edge compact uses less material so if you're a little bit uh, having not a lot of material this uses less material this is easier to machine so if you, you have trouble machining uh, this is this is easier to machine when we did tests when I was at Westinghouse we always sent them outside we didn't have a good machine shop a lot of universities or uh, companies don't have a good machine shop it's often best to use a specialist to do that machining Let's see I guess that's that's uh, that then here's the compact specimen used in K1C testing notice it has uh, tolerances here and also surface finishes for the various points and those should be followed however I've never seen anybody report on that if they don't make those tolerances I've never seen anybody say this test didn't work because we didn't make the machining tolerances but you're supposed to follow that um, okay so to test these two specimens you need fixtures Fixtures for a tension type is called pin and clevis. Fixtures for a bend type is called bend fixture. A uh, very, very novel name. Uh, before I show you fixtures, the other thing you have to do is say the direction that you've taken the specimen out of the product form. Because the direction does make a difference in toughness. Some directions have lower toughness than other direction and ASTM uses the two letter uh, thing to um, tell you what the direction is the first letter is the direction of the loading and the second letter is the direction that the crack would go in and since we're in mode one loading the mode one would have a first letter different directions from a second letter so for example LT means you're testing an L which is the rolling direction for, for this plate and then the crack is growing the other way in transverse or TL means you're loading in a transverse direction the crack grows in the rolling direction so L is for rolling T is for transverse and through thickness is called S short transverse if you have other product forms like a forged round plate or forge around something they have different things but it's very important then that you specify the direction that you've taken the specimen from your structure um, mention this would be extremely important in composite materials because in composite materials 
it's so anisotropic that you would have to know which way it would be. It's even so in, in uh, metals. Anyway, here are the pre-cracking requirements. The main thing is that you have the maximum K while pre-cracking be less than 60% of KQ. Now you don't know what KQ is yet and you'll learn that later and when you're pre-cracking you don't know what KQ is. So this is kind of something you guess at and people who are uh, testing a lot usually know about where to, to do that but if you don't you'll have to wait and learn what KQ is in a little bit. So here are the fixtures that I said. Ben fixture for Ben, pin and clevis for that. Some machines have other fixture types but these are the two most commonly used. Here's a Ben fixture and it has rollers to support the specimen and then the load comes from the top here. Uh, now you have to measure displacement. This is a displacement gauge. I'll give you more details on that in a little bit. So this is loaded like this. Important thing in all the testing is to avoid frictions. So as you load a specimen like this, it would come down and it would then sort of bow, exaggerate it, but bow like that. These pins would roll out. So they usually start it inside so they roll, roll away and they don't bind as you are loading. Here's a clevis. The specimen goes up in here in this thing and then the pin goes through that way you can see here's the pinhole from the other direction. Uh, then you would hook this to a, a loading rod of some kind. This is usually threaded, so you'd hook that to a loading rod, and then the specimen would have a top clevis and a bottom clevis. Important thing here to note is that the pinhole is not perfectly round pinhole, but it has to have a flat area. The flat area is so that you can lay the, the loading pin in that area and not bind against the edges. Um, in K1C testing it's not as important as in some other testing. What happens if you get the pin binding, you're supposed to have purely tension load. If the pin binds you get a kind of reverse couple that gives you a bending moment on the specimen and however small it is it still might influence the test. So that's the, that's the fixture for that. Um, then you need a machine to test it in and for pre-cracking we use servo hydraulic machines usually because you can get good rapid load control and um, you can use it for fracture toughness as well. For fracture toughness you can use screw driven machine. Screw driven machine has better control for the most part but if you use it for pre-cracking where you're doing tens and hundreds of thousands of cycles, you're going to wear the, the screws out on your screw machine. I don't know, you, you have, what kind of testing machines you have here? You use MTS and Instron at all or? Yeah. So MTFs and Instron are fairly popular in the US and uh, Europe has their own machines that they use. So the servo hydraulic is uh, probably the one that most people use and all the machines have a load cell. So one of the things you have to measure in, in your test is the load. So we'll talk about that later, but you have a load cell. Now, I don't know if you know how servo hydraulic machines work. You specify that you want to go to a certain value of something like load it to uh, 10 kilonewtons. So you, you dial that in and then it puts oil, some kind of oil pushing on a piston and it pushes the piston and then it measures the load with the load cell and when you get to 10 kilonewtons it stops. But it does it quickly. Like uh, fractions of a second. Boom! You're there. And if you aren't careful you can interrupt that feedback loop and and you can do bad things. Uh, when you're using test machines 
you got to be careful. I've seen people cut their fingers off in test machine, uh, get a whole bunch of new equipment and smash it to bits because they had a problem. When you're uh, using a test machine, the rule I have is if you have any part of the body that you like a lot, like your fingers, your head, or, or whatever else, keep them out of the loading line. Don't get them in the loading line because you never know when a problem is going to come and you don't want to lose some part of your body unless you, you're tired of having it. But a lot of people are used to having fingers and, and stuff like that. And so, okay, so that has load cell. Now, the load cell needs A to D conversion. And uh, uh, the A to D conversion, these load cells have strain gauges and they're uh, analog. So when you, you have an analog signal, uh, if you're using computer control, uh, computers are normally digital. So you need some kind of conversion to go from analog to digital. And uh, we started using computer control back in uh, 1970s, I guess, in Westinghouse to show you what computers have done. When we first started, we had a computer that had 8K of RAM. If you can imagine a computer with 8K of RAM. And um, one day somebody came and said, we've got to upgrade. We're going to go from 8K of RAM to 16K of RAM. And the people who used the computers said, who would ever need 16K of RAM on your computer? Um, you know, what are we going to do with all that memory? So now we're using uh, mega hertz, uh, mega and, and giga rather than K. You can see where the computers have come in, what, 40 years from, from real little things to, and, and things haven't gotten bigger, of course, they're just more memory. Um, so A to D conversion. Displacement gauges, here's some of the ones that are, could be used. Most people that I know use clip gauge. Clip gauge looks like this. It is an analog device as well, and usually you take two thin pieces of metal. These are thin pieces of metal. Clamp them in some kind of clamping device and put load set or strain gauges on the top and the bottom. So one goes on top, one on the bottom, top and bottom on the two arms. And then you arrange that in a Wheatstone bridge arrangement and put an excitation voltage on and then measure the output. And you want to have gauge both the load cell and the, the clip gauge to have a linear electrical signal with a linear whatever you're measuring. Like here, displacement. You want to have linear displacement versus electrical signal. These gauges can do that. If it's not linear, it makes a harder calibration. So uh, usually they're set up to be linear uh, relationship between the two. And that, that's the normal clip gauge. So in the K1C test, you have to measure load and you have to measure displacement. Those are the two main things. There are other gauges like, well, mechanical gauges are okay, but you can't put that input into a computer. But some of the other gauges you can, but people, as I said, normally use a clip gauge. Here are some other details in the K1C test. If you're pre-cracking, you need to have uh, it's load control pretty much for your pre-cracking. However, when you do the test, load control isn't good. You should use displacement control or crosshead control, depending on the machine. What happens when you get to a maximum load and it starts to come reduced from maximum load, if you have load control and your uh, servo hydraulic machine is demanding more and more load, when you get to a maximum load, it just rip everything apart. So you, you can't get the full load and displacement curve in load control, but load control is good for pre-cracking.
Some of the specimens use side grooving. And um, I'll show you, well, I, don't, I didn't bring specimens along. S side grooving is often used by putting a groove on the side of the specimen to keep the crack front straight. If you're going to do side grooving, you should do that after pre-cracking. If you do it before pre-cracking, you can get cracks to run down the side groove. Uh, normally, you test at other temperatures than room temperature. And if you're either heating or cooling, you should do a soak time, 30 minutes per inch of thickness. And uh, that could be 30 minutes per uh, 25 millimeters. So normal test specimens, if you're using uh, engineering units, normally you have an inch thick. You can have thicker, but often it's an inch thick. If you're doing SI units, normal is 25 millimeters. So so you would that have that. So you should soak 30 minutes. Now, heating is usually done in the furnace, but you can use some kind of heating tapes and things to heat a specimen. And cooling, we used to use a little styrofoam box and blow in liquid nitrogen. And then you need a thermocouple and some feedback loop to tell you when you've gotten to temperature. So you would cool this down, say, and you get to the temperature you want and then sit and wait 30 minutes to make sure the specimen is cooled all the way through. Um, temperatures should be controlled within plus and minus three degrees Celsius. So that's, that's the setup to get started. Now, during the test, you need a procedure, and the procedure is like this. You load in displacement control at a given rate and and measure load and measure displacement, those two things. Um, originally was measured on a recorder. I don't know if nobody here has used recorders yet or anybody old enough. Rather than computers, we used to do that in the old, old days. And whenever you had a recorder and start the test, you had a pen writing on the paper. And about halfway through the test, the pen would clog up and wouldn't work anymore. So you have to stop the test, unclog the pen, and start all over again. Computers took care of that. So now you measure digitally with a computer. The loading rate has to be between 30 and 150 KSI root inches per minute. And um, conversion from KSI root inch to MPA root meter is 1.1. 1, 1. 1 KSI root inch is 1.1 1. 1 MPA root meter. So you could just say, 33 and 165 would be the equivalent. And the reason you have a rate, you want to be slow enough to avoid dynamic effects. I'll talk about the dynamic part later. But you want to be fast enough to avoid time-dependent effects. And, and these are more important at higher temperature, where you have uh, maybe a creeping type effect, or if you have a bad environment, it, that's important. You keep loading the specimen until it either fractures or you pass a maximum load. And then you have to identify PQ and Pmax. And now I'll show you in a, a schematic what PQ and Pmax are. Here are the words for it. PQ is the highest load up to a 5% seeking crossing. Pmax is the highest load. So this is what it looks like. These are in the standard. In this test where you go up, hit a maximum load, and come back down again. To get the PQ, you have to do the original slope, and then you have to take 5% secant. A secant slope is where you start at the same origin and have a 5% lower, uh, lower thing. And then where you cross that uh, with the 5% secant is the PQ point. And it's the highest load up into the crossing point. For example, here's the crossing point, And now the highest load is back here, is higher. Here's a specimen that probably just snapped in two. And for brittle fracture, uh, that happens. It snaps in two. For ductile fracture, you usually go through a maximum load. To, to uh, get that 5% secant is sometimes difficult. I like to do this on, put this on a cross-hatched paper, 
and um, count squares. You can do it with a computer. You can get your computer to do it for you as well. If you do it by hand, you have to be careful. I used to give this to graduate students, and for them, 5% had an error of about plus and minus 25%. So error of 25% on 5% isn't good at all. Anyway, this is the PQ, the highest load up to the 5% secant crossing, and Pmax is the highest load. Next thing you would have to do is make sure the specimen is broken in two. If you haven't broken it in two like this one, you have to go back and break it in two and measure the original uh, crack length and then calculate KQ and PQ as I'll show you in a little bit. So here's how you measure crack length. This is the fracture surface. You're looking down. Uh, this would be a bend specimen or a compact specimen with two pieces. And then you're looking down at the top of that and you measure three points on here, which are the um, center point and the quarter points, and then you average those three. This is only for K, uh, one C calculation. You do other ways for other tests, but you average those three points, then you usually measure the surfaces, and they have to be within 10% of this average. So you get an average crack length told you uh, yesterday that K is based on a straight across crack and you would assume then that this is a straight across crack but when you do an actual test you never do get a straight across crack you always get some kind of we call this thumbnailing some some non uh, uniform thing and so you'll usually have to average that to, to make it be on the average a straight across crack the KQ is measured from the PQ, so we have the PQ from this. The KQ then uses this form, uh, PQ and, and the little f form that we were playing with yesterday. The little f form and then you get KQ. Now the Q means it's provisional. It's not quite K1C yet, it's provisional K1C and we got to see if it's going to be a K1C or not. So it, it's provisional, meaning it's tentatively K1C, but not for sure. Um, here are the um, three main validity requirements. I told you along the way, the machining tolerances, the fatigue pre-cracking, and all those have to be followed, but they're not always reported well, but these have to be reported. The initial crack a over W has to be about 0.5. That means that halfway through. So it has to be between 0.45 and 0.55. Now you, you have that leeway because you can't, uh, with, the, with a thumbnail crack, you can't always hit it right on because when you're pre-cracking, you're watching the crack usually from the surface. This would be a surface of, of the specimen and you can't see inside because it hasn't broken yet. <coughs> Pmax over PQ, uh, PQ has to be less than, uh, Pmax has to be less than 10% more than PQ. So back here again, if, if this distance is too much, more than 10%, it's not good. And then this is the main one. This is the size criterion. And this, this has to do with the plastic zone. If you remember, we, we just did this a little bit ago, K over the yield strength squared, uh, here it's 2.5 is the coefficient. That means then that in this case, the plastic zone is about 1 to 15 of, of the ligament. If all these validity things are satisfied, K then is a K1C. Now, in a lot of cases, you get R curve effect. We talked a little bit about R curves yesterday and that means that the thing doesn't snap into two but rather it it uh, comes apart gradually. If that happens you have to pick a point where you're measuring fracture toughness and the 5% secant does that. The 5% secant makes sure that you have a crack extension of 2% of the original crack size. So 
So it's actually a point on the R curve that you're getting by doing the 5% secant. And you need an R curve that's relatively flat. If it's not flat, uh, you will get this thing doesn't work. P max and PQ doesn't work. So here, here these all satisfy, then KQ is K1C. They're not all satisfied, KQ stays to be KQ. What do you do if you have a KQ and, and it uh, didn't work? Well, you can look at this. Well, here's the plastic zone calculation, and I just want to show you that, that this is related to this. Anyway, when you don't get a valid test, you still have KQ. If you want to see how close you are, you can measure something called stress ratio. The stress ratio is a mechanics and materials nominal stress at the crack tip divided by yield strength. Now you could do that calculation yourself, but there are formulas. For example, for the compact specimen, stress ratio R sub S C for compact has that form. And that automatically gives you um, the stress mechanics and materials stre stress at the crack tip uh, divided by the yield strength here. For the stress ratio you use Pmax. For K1C of course you use the PQ for K1C but, but for this you use Pmax. Um, <clears throat> if you do a stress ratio and I almost always calculate this because if you want to see if you made a mistake this will help tell if you have a stress ratio less than one you almost certainly have a valid K1C test it it is pretty good chance you have valid K1C if you have a stress ratio greater than two you're almost fully plastic and you probably can never ever get uh, get that to work so you, you wouldn't get that to work and then <clears throat> If you're closer to one, if you're greater than one but close to one, chances are you could make a bigger specimen maybe and, and get a valid test. Now, um, that's about time to take a break, but do you have questions that you want to talk about from this? <coughs> then I want to show you some fracture toughness properties and it's... Uh, three o'clock so we'll take a break what the 330 is our normal break time and so come back here at 330 and we'll get uh, get on with this whole idea I told you this is my first time in India and of course I've only seen Pune but um, I don't know how many of you have been in the US but the one thing we don't have is two wheelers we, we have some, but you see maybe one or two in a day. And here you see uh, hundreds and hundreds in a day. And um, some people have accidents, I guess. Like, <laughs> had accidents. So we, we both have a bad knee. So we have something in common. The other thing we're talking about was the, with a gentleman he came from the olden days. He's, his first computer had 64K RAM. I told you we had 8K. Now, what he said now he has 128 gigabytes or something on his RAM. I, and uh, for those of you who are young, you don't remember days without cell phones and calculators. We had no calculator. We used the slide rule. I don't know if anybody here, you ever use slide rules? Slide rules no calculators. Uh, well, if you really get stuck, use your fingers. Told you about those cats that can't seem to learn to count without their toes. Okay, so 10 minutes early, but um, you've done the fracture toughness test. Now I want to show you some of the properties and uh, where you can find some of the properties because the, f the fracture toughness properties are um, important. Um, <clears throat>
just to say about that fracture toughness testing, it can get expensive. So a lot of people would prefer to find fracture toughness properties somewhere else in the literature or whatever rather than come and do the test themselves. It seemed like in the 1970s we had a lot of money to do testing whenever you want it, but by 1990s or, or so, nobody wanted to do testing anymore. So there weren't that many opportunities and had to look places for properties. Now, here's one I want to show you. Th this is an interaction of the size effect. Um, these are inches, but one inch is 25 millimeters and so forth. 10 inches would be 250 millimeters. What happened in this test is that it was a steel. A533B is a steel that they use for pressure vessels in nuclear uh, power generation, like a nuclear reactor for, for electricity generation. And it has a transition. And you can see the strength level over here. Uh, if you are not good at conversion, one KSI is about seven MPAs. So this would be um, 700 MPAs here, uh, 350 and so forth. Anyway, getting back to this, when, when they did the test, they used the smallest specimens possible and it worked good and they got valid K1C tests. Again, the main problem is that size criterion is 2.5 K over the yield strength squared and that makes sure that the plastic zone is small enough. Uh, plastic zone size is relative to the particular test method. It varies from one kind of test to another. Anyway, as they went up in temperature, yield strength came down. Toughness went up. So that fraction K Q over the yield strength and square that, eventually the specimen is too small. So they made a bigger specimen. And two inches thick, 50 millimeters, and then that got too small. So it went bigger, 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 up to 12 inches. Uh, 12 inches would be 300 millimeters thick and uh, 600 millimeters planar size is pretty big. Um, pretty big specimen and weighs quite a bit. And they got one test that was okay and one didn't make it. So, and they hadn't reached the top where this should bend over. So this showed way back then that linear elastic fracture mechanics would not work for all steels. You had to do something else. And that, that would get me then to the topic of week two when we talk about nonlinear fracture mechanics parameters. But here was trying to do that. And here you see the specimens. It's a little bit hard, there's no scale on this, but this is 25 millimeters thick. That's 250 millimeters thick, and, uh, or maybe 300. And so they, all those specimens were tested and got up to here, but no farther. Now, steels, in that strength range have ductile or brittle transition. If you look at some other metals, here is aluminum alloy. You can see K1C with temperature is almost absolutely flat. There's almost no, no uh, variation. However, in steel, in aluminum alloys, toughness is fairly low. This is about 35 as opposed to here where you get start above 35 and get up in the hundreds. Here are some more, a titanium alloy. Toughness is in about 70, it's much tougher than aluminum. Here is a high strength steel. The real high strength steels, and, and this is uh, almost 200 KSI, which would be about uh, 1400 MPAs, 1400 MPAs is uh, fairly high strength steel, it doesn't have a transition. It just has a, just a, has a constant toughness. Here are some sources of data. People, as I said, often want to find data rather than do the tests themselves. Um, some of them are not 
real easy to find, but th there's some places. Here's one thing that has a lot of data in it. It's almost um, 20, it's more than 20 years old, but it is called Damage Tolerant Design Handbook and was done by the Air Force. Wright Laboratory is in Dayton, Ohio, which is the home of an Air Force lab. Uh, it was sponsored by the U.S. government. Anything that is sponsored by the U.S. government has to be public information. That means that you can get this without having to pay anything, unlike private things like ASTM and ISO and all these other agencies, where if you want something from them, you've got to pay. pay. Here, I got the whole handbook downloaded just by typing in the Damage Tolerant Design Handbook, and it popped up, and I could load it down on uh, my computer. And so I show you a few pages. This has K1C data. It has data from all different fracture mechanics types testing, but K1C is one of them. So here are some K1C values, and it has on there the alloy, heat treat condition, product form whether it's a forging or a plate and other things. Now, told you that in the K1C test, you're supposed to say what direction the specimen came from because it is important. If you just look at this top one, here is LT and versus TL. LT means that you pull in the uh, rowing direction and it runs across the kind of the rowing that rowing direction get grains get elongated if you're not familiar with the metallurgy the grains get elongated so this would have a crack running across the grains TL is the opposite way you are pulling in the transverse direction and you're uh, then cracks running along the grains so this is pretty hard to see um, see if I can read some numbers you, you are going to get a hand out of this where you can take a magnifying glass to it eventually and see it. Uh, mean value here is about 160s and that's 130s. See here be 130s, 120s. Uh, almost without, without anything else, the um, LT direction has higher toughness than the TL. So this is a steel alloy. Here's an aluminum alloy. And it, it has some values. For example, LT, these are mean of number test 31. In the other direction, it's 23. This, at least I can read, 34, 30. So again, the same thing happened. Um, had a friend who I went to graduate school with at Lehigh who ended up working for Alcoa. You probably know Alcoa makes aluminum. It's a big aluminum manufacturer. And he worked in the research lab at Alcoa and he had to do tests and they, in the early days at least, whenever they produced an ingot, they had to do K1C tests in six directions. And he said the K1C testing cost more than it did to produce the whole ingot. So they, so it, it's an expensive thing. That's why people don't want to do testing anymore, but it, that was an expensive thing. One of the books is Hertzberg, and I don't know if any of you are metallurgists, but Hertzberg is a metallurgist, and he's material science oriented. He has some data in there. So here's K1C data from Hertzberg. Now, one of the things people do is K1C correlations. Uh, in the days before fracture mechanics, one of the toughness tests was Sharpie impact. The Sharpie impact uh, was was a quantitative or a qualitative test. Unlike unlike um, fracture toughness, K1C is is quantitative. This is qualitative. You get a number, but you couldn't use it for design. The test is ASTM E23. ASTM writes their tests with this number being chronological. So 23 actually came in the 1920s. That's how old this test is. K1C 
399 came in the 1970s. So uh, numbers keep going up. Nowadays, I think the number is about E3000. So they get more and more test methods coming in. Anyway, people were familiar with the Sharpie impact test and they thought it would be good to do correlations between Sharpie impact and K1C. For one, the Sharpie impact just takes a notch. You, you make a little rectangular bar, put a notch in it, and whack. You whack it and get a number. Uh, it's a cheap to make and it's easy to test. It only takes um, seconds to test it, maybe minutes to set it up, as opposed to K1C where you have to do the pre-cracking and all that other stuff and all the analysis. This is just bang and it's over. Here's what a Sharpie impact tester looks like. Uh, if you work in materials at all, you've probably seen one. You have you have a loading uh, anvil kind of thing that is on a rod and is raised to a height and then the specimen comes here and then you release that and it swings like a pendulum wax the specimen and breaks it in two and then swings up the other side now the difference between where it started and where it ends up over here is a measure of how much energy went into breaking that specimen in two so that's Sharpie impact energy it's called and and it's done uh, this is another case where you, if you like your fingers you don't want to put your fingers down where the specimen is because it would it takes a steel specimen about the size of your finger and just wax it in two you can imagine what it could do to a finger anyway here are the results the three things that are measured energy absorbed I, I told you the difference between where it starts and where it ends up is energy absorbed and that's this one and the other one is percent brittle or percent ductile and that's a qualitative thing where people look at the fracture surface and say it looks like it's completely brittle or it looks like it's completely ductile or it looks like somewhere in between uh, you tell that brittle is shinier than ductile. Ductile is darker and brittle is shinier. So if it's real shiny all the way through, it's 100% brittle. If it's all dark, it's ductile. Anyway, one of the measures in a Sharpie test is called FATT. It's 50% uh, fracture appearance transition temperature. So where you have 50% brittle, 50% ductile, is FATT, again, fracture appearance transition temperature. And that's an important point. So that, that and also lateral expansion, which isn't used in this correlation. Anyway, this, this would be done, each point here is one specimen, of course. They did a lot, but normally you could do about 10 or so specimens, 10 or 12, and get the full curve out of that. Now, one of the correlations this Begley Logston was done for steel alloys with ductile to brittle transition. They had four points that they used. All the data are unit specific, so they have to be careful of the units. KSI, square root of inch, and degrees Fahrenheit, which people still use. So they want to get this uh, measure of that. So point one was K1C is 25 at minus 320F. No test needed there. Point two, K1C is 45% of the yield strength at 0% ductile. 0% ductile would be here, 100% brittle at this temperature. Point three, they used this correlation which was attributed to Barsom and Rolf. Barsom and Rolf correlation and they did that at 100% ductile and these values are have to be in engineering units. They, they're unit specific, but this is Sharpie energy, yield strength, K1C, gives you a K1C number. So that's, that's one that's done here, 100% at this temperature exactly where you get 100% ductile, 0% brittle. And then finally, between point two and three, uh, you average that toughness and do that at 50% FATT, which is, again, this, this temperature, 50% right here somewhere. 
Anyway, here are the three points. One point is minus 320. The next point is at 100% brittle. The third point is 100% ductile. And then the, the fourth point is average of the two at FATT. <coughs> So you draw the curve kind of zigzaggedy here to here, here to here, here to here, and then straight across. <coughs> In this case, this, this is actual fracture toughness testing that was used to compare with that, different size specimens. The number here tells you about what the thickness is. One T was, was one inch thick, 25 millimeters, AT would have been uh, 8 inches thick or about 200 millimeters thick. Anyway, you can see you can't get to the top even with, with this material. So, But the, the correlation pretty much gives you the transition. This Sharpie correlation was something that people were looking for because one, it was easy and it worked pretty well if you uh, were stayed within your class of materials. You, you couldn't take that method and generalize it. For example, it wouldn't work at all with non-metals or non-ferrous metals. It had to be steel. Number two, you had to stick to your own class, like a yield strength of, of about 100 KSI yield, whatever. So it, it's okay, but it's not real great. Here's some other types of fracture toughness tests that um, people have done and some of them are still in the standard. I'll tell you a little bit about them. KR curve testing they use for real thin plates and it's mostly done in the aerospace like the thin sheets that they use on air, airplane structures. Uh, they did the KR curve testing and that is then a standard. It's still in the books as far as I know it's based on K and it's a plot of K versus crack extension as I showed you before. It's just K versus crack extension. Uh, real high strength sheets and it was an old method. You can see 561 is a little bit after K1C but not too much. So that's one of them. The other thing is a test called the dynamic fracture toughness test. People were worried about rapid loading. Uh, rapid loading is loading that goes from zero to failure in milliseconds. <clears throat> Microseconds is too fast, seconds is too slow, so it's milliseconds and usually about one to ten. Between one and ten milliseconds you do that and it's like this. K1C parentheses T. T is the loading time to get to KQ in milliseconds. As I said, usually one to 10 milliseconds. Uh, to do that, you need a real rapid load machine. Now, the most rapid load machine that people have is their Sharpie impact tester. That loads very quickly. That doesn't have a load cell in, so it's hard to really get a quantitative value of K from that because you don't have a load cell. Some people put strain gauges on the, the striker and then they try to make a correlation, but it's not really good. This um, is this test is important for fast loading like seismic. Other rapid loading would be maybe uh, a attack load like uh, gunfire, a bomb going off. If if the military would be interested in high rate loading due to some accident conditions the people building uh, power stations on fault lines and, and worried about uh, earthquakes would do that. So. so that's used. Now, the the test method for K1C parentheses T is in three, E399. And it's almost like the K1C test, except they use what's called the dynamic yield strength. The dynamic yield strength is higher generally than, than the quasi-static yield strength of a material. So there's an equation in there. If you know how fast you have loaded this 
the specimen or make a guess, you can get a dynamic yield strength. Um, this is how the toughness turns out. If you have very fast loading, on the lower shelf, the more brittle area, dynamic loading usually reduces fracture toughness pretty much. It also makes the transition go to a higher temperature, but on the upper shelf, upper part, it switches over, so it looks like this. This first line here is regular K1C, and, and remember regular K1C has to be done between about 30 and 150 seconds, so sometimes in, in the range of a minute. And this is the rapid load done in milliseconds. <coughs> and uh, you can see here, not only is it lower in the, in the low thing, but it has a higher transition temperature. So if you would be designing in there and have rapid load, you'd have to be careful. Once you get to the upper shelf, though, it crosses over. So, and here's some examples of high rate uh, K1Cs. Another test, and this is a mess, and the reason I'm showing you this is because of um, it's going to come up later. So you, you want to know about this because it'll come up. This is testing done, uh, crack arrest. And what happens in this test, a crack is started in a weld bead and forced into a material where it arrests. And then K1A is determined by the load and the crack length at the arrest point. Now I have an example that's going to show you what happens when you have a very stiff loading situation. I haven't showed you that yet. And this test has no fatigue pre-crack, just a weld bead. And here's a standard for it. It's still used. So this is what the specimen looks like. Um, here's a weld bead. It is side grooves seriously because you want to get the crack to grow straight, but it doesn't anyway you load like this, you put a split pin in there with a wedge, the wedge forces the pin open, and then this weld bead uh, is martensitic, very high strength, very brittle material, but it's just a little bead here, so it starts the crack growing, and then it should grow into the specimen and stop. And then they try to get K when the specimen stops. Now I'm going to show you how to do that later, so we're a little bit out of sequence there, but um, this this uh, test method is quite a mess. Um, what happens is that the, the dark here is actual crack advanced due to the thing, and then the light is where it rests. And you can see here it's not very straight. Here it's not straight at all. It has little fingers of growth and fingers of not growth. So that test is one big mess, but it's used. About the only people that can do this test is that laboratory near us in Knoxville, Oak Ridge National Lab. They, d they do this test. One thing that's important then is effect of thickness. Uh, thick specimens or structures are what we call plain strain. They have through thickness constraint. Plain strain tends to have lower toughness than thin specimens. Thin specimens are in plain stress. Plain stress allows then the slip to be out of plane uh, through the thickness. Thick specimens keeps the slip in the plane and so thick specimens lower toughness, thin specimens higher toughness. And between them there seems to be a transition. So this is a schematic showing that this is supposed to be the thick specimens. What happens in the thick specimen is that the plastic zone is much smaller and remember we said that George Irwin said it should be 1 over 6 pi instead of 1 over 2 pi so it's smaller however at the surface you get plain stress anyway but in in the middle you get plain strain and small small plastic zone and a lot of constraint you can see through thickness constraint whereas the thin specimen you get necking and slip through the plane, and so you get real high toughness. This is the thin specimen. Thickness is here. 
thin specimen, real high toughness, thick specimen, lower toughness. Now the whole K1C concept of having a size criterion is to try to force the, the uh, specimen to get on this lower plane. And if you get on that lower plane, then they theorize that you have a, a constant value of K for failure that is not dependent on thickness anymore. So here it depends on the thickness. Here it doesn't depend on the thickness anymore. And if you get down here, then you get a conservative toughness. And it is, is a real K1C. Uh, what happens if you have a thin structure and you don't want to have this conservative K1C, you have to do the test of the, the thickness of the, the specimen that you have. So you, you would have to do that, that exact uh, specimen. Here's just to show you, here's a standard that has terminology. So all the different standards put their terminology in that. If you want to know what a, term, what a term means or a letter means, you can look it up in that. Okay, that's the end. Any questions about properties? Okay, then here's Here's something I think you'll be able to do. And ah, you might have to help you with this for one reason. You don't have it printed out. Normally I would have this printed out for people, but I don't have it printed out here. Um, so might look at it and then we'll go through the analysis. Here, here's a K1C test and I put this in engineering units because I have a graph that I couldn't change and was in engineering units. So a K1C test was conducted on a specimen W equals 4, B equals 2, A naught is uh, 2.1 that's the original ori initial crack size. And I, I think that I could give you preliminary results and then you could go from there. So I want you to analyze this according to um, ASTM. So analyze this according to ASTM E399. Um, I have an SI version, which W is it's 100, B is 50, A is 52 and a half, yield strength is 700, and then you can convert on here. But um, here's the low displacement record. And this low displacement record, the, the thing you can't do on that, since you don't have your own paper, is to get the KQ and the, K, uh, the PQ and the P max. So I'm going to give you that. And then once you get the PQ and the P max, you have to go back here and try to um, work out the K1C using the, the thing that we did. Now, um, K solution, I hope you have that somewhere. You use P little f and then thickness B and square root of W for that solution. Now let me see if I can find here. Okay. Now if he'll, he'll scroll. This is the load and displacement record that was on the previous slide. Um, I measured for you PQ and P max. So what what you needed for this is to have the original slope here and then the 5% secant slope. You can see the 5% secant slope hits at a point lower than the maximum peak here. So the maximum peak is taken as the PQ because PQ is the highest load up to and including the intersection of the 5% secant. So again, original slope here, 
5% secant, the dashed line, PQ, and then absolute maximum load is P max. Now, if he'll let me go down a little bit without going away, well, here's the whole thing, but you, you should try to work out. Let me show you these two numbers. You need them. PQ is 31 kips. P max is 33. And you can either do this in SI units or uh, regular engineering units. Some of my problems I kept in engineering units because, as I said, I had the graph and I didn't know how to, I couldn't redo the graph. This is a little bit jumpy. If I try to scroll gradually, it jumps. So 31 and 33 are those two numbers. That's 31 is PQ, 33 is, um, is P max, and you need you need this. You need those values. So again, as I said, again, you have here uh, engineering units or SI units. Take your pick. I'll, I'll give you about 10 minutes to work on that. Oh, here was my KQ 91.2. You got it? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. So if you, if you got it, you're doing good. You should be happy with yourselves, and I'm happy with you. Let, let me talk about these a little bit. Um, I don't know if I can go back and forth too much. S, SI, PQ is 31, P max is 33. Now, almost everything starts with A over W and getting the little f or the big f depending what you want so a over w 0.525 little f is 10.45 about kq uses the pq of course and then i got about 81 so i want to do validity p max was 33 and pq 31 that fraction was about 1.065 it has to be less than 1.1 so that's an okay um, see the A over W talk about that it has to be between 0.45 and 0.55 nominally 0.5 that was okay now the size criterion this, this is the one that usually does it in it, you can't make the size criterion so the size criterion 2.5 KQ 81 over the yield strength 100 is 1.64 that's less than thickness, which was 2, and less than the original crack size, which was 2.1. That's okay. So we say that KQ is um, K1C in that case. Now, I told you I, I like to do strength ratio. You didn't have the equation, but this is the equation for strength ratio. It's, again, it's a, a kind of a arm waving idea to see how close you are if you miss KQ. We didn't miss we didn't miss the K1C here, but check it anyway. And I like to check extra stuff because every once in a while you push the wrong button on your calculator. That's the bad thing about the calculator. Uh, slide rules never had buttons, so you never hit the wrong button on a slide rule. But there are other problems with that. Anyway, RSC uses the Pmax, uses this equation. 2 times P max times bracket 2W plus A slash thickness B W minus A quantity squared yield strength. All those numbers together gave 0 0.92. 0 0.92 is less than 1. That all fits. This is less than 1. This is all valid. That all fits. So, so I'm happy. Now let me do quickie on the SI.
um, I converted. Um, for some reason, in in the teaching we do in Tennessee, we use both sets of units, and SI and, and I don't know why in the world the U.S. wants to go with engineering units. The only country in the world, engineering units are called English units. The English don't, units don't use their own units. They use SI. The whole world uses SI. And somebody says, well, if we use, if we use those units, people would get confused at the grocery store and at the gas pumps. But we buy uh, soft drinks in two-liter bottles, and we buy everything we buy with weight has kilograms on it as well as pounds so what what's the big deal but um, people in the government well you, you probably noticed that most of the people in our government are stupid and um, today is the day when we we continue that trend perhaps anyway let me sh tell you then I, I remember since we've used both sets of units I know conversions pretty well because I had 25 years of conversions so 4.448 times kips is kilonewtons 138 kilonewtons P max doing the same thing 148 D did you convert like that okay and A over W 0.525 the same same deal Again, when you're doing SI, it's best to use meganewtons because the the answer comes out in megapascal squared a meter. So MPA is megapascal. So I use meganewtons here. I didn't put all the units in. Again, F is unitless, and then I use the the dimensions in meters since it comes out in megapascals and meters so 0.05 meters for thickness 0.1 meter for uh, the width w square root of that 91.2 now I told you the conversion is about 1.1 uh, so I don't know if you can do 81 times 1.1 in your head it doesn't convert exactly right I tried that and I'll tell you why because um, I made this be 50 millimeters 2 inches is 50.8 4 inches is 100.16 or something so that that little bit of a fraction difference between 50 millimeters and and 2 inches conversion threw that off because I think uh, 81 times 1.1 is about 89 something instead of 91 anyway enough of that so the validity checks in SI get about the same numbers the size criteria 0 0.0042 meters which is 42.4 millimeters which is less than 50 millimeters that's okay and it's less than the original crack length that's okay and here is the um, this A over W criterion now I think I also did RSC and RSC maybe didn't come out exactly the same but because of the slight size differences but 0.94 again less than one in the linear elastic range that that should be good any questions about these calculations yeah yes if it's not satisfied I go ahead anyway uh, tell you when when we write the standards I worked on standards committees I don't know if you were here for that first stuff where they said all kinds of weird stuff about me but I worked on a lot of standards and when we write the standards we have a lot of arguments about what should things be 
One person said that number ought to be one. Somebody else says no, that no number ought to be five. And then they argue and they say, oh, let's make it two and a half. That's halfway in between. So it goes into the standard two and a half. And then by the time it gets balloted and out in the book, and everybody sees that number, they say that is absolute truth. It has to be so. But in order to get there, it was a big argument between should it be less, should it be more. So some of those numbers aren't very important. And that, that number is not very important. If you have P max over PQ is two, that's not good. 1.5, not good. 1.15, uh, who cares? 1.15 is close enough for me. Again, the, the 2.5 times K over the yield strength squared, that's the main one. And if you just barely miss it, again, that's okay. But if you're way off on that one, it's not good. But the Pmax over PQ, I wouldn't get too worried about that. Have you had trouble with that in something? Just wondering what? Yeah, just wondering. Um, the other one, while we're talking, Aver W should be about 0.5. If it's not 0.5, if it's really higher or lower, it throws off the calibration of things. So, so that it's part of the calibration has to be that. So that would get thrown off. So that um, unless you went through the process, you wouldn't know what each one does. The Pmax over PQ is to try to keep the R curve a little bit flat. But that's, uh, but that, that's an interesting question. And uh, we argued about that 100 years ago or so, maybe only 30, but uh, it's interesting to bring it up again. Other questions? Um, we said we'd start 10 minutes early and stop 10 minutes early. It is end of the problem, like at 20 after 4, so why don't we stop? And uh, we're going to be tomorrow, same time, same place new material. Tomorrow I think I'll do fatigue if you want to think about fatigue. So I want to do fatigue tomorrow because fatigue is one of the, the real major things about for failure. Uh, almost everything fails by fatigue that fails. <laughs>